Hey there, and welcome to the this video on <laughs> Show What They Know, online demonstrations of learning. This is one of our videos from online learning ideas, helping educators make sense of online learning. Yo, we're gonna be talking about showing what they know, having students be able to show us what's in the brain, what they've learned, so we can make adjustments and we're so thankful to have you along here with us on this uh, video. And so my name is Matt Miller. I'm the author of Ditch That Textbook. And to my, to my left, but really to my right, if you're watching, <laughs> I've got Holly Clark here. Holly, do you want to do a quick introduction? Uh, Holly Clark, author of Microsoft Infused Classroom and Google Infused Classroom, soon to be Chromebook Infused Classroom. <laughs> Ooh. And hello. You're infusing all of the classrooms, aren't you? Uh, tirelessly. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. So um, so if you're watching this on the video replay, welcome. We're so glad to have you along and checking this out. If you're watching this live, we would love for you to be able to check in and tell us who you are and where you are. And we've already got several people checking in here. Yeah. So let's say hi to some of the people that are here. There's Kim from North Carolina. We've got Jean from Oklahoma. Whoa. We've got Jamie from Massachusetts. We've got Nancy, and she says, can't wait to learn more from Matt and Holly. You are in the right place. Whoa. We've got Jen from Oregon. We've got Rebecca from New York oh. City living in Northern New Jersey. We um, have there's York. another New Yorker. Yay, uh -huh. from New York. Yeah, so Sarah's here from Brooklyn, and then we've got Matt from Massachusetts. Massachusetts is representing today. There's Lynn from Philadelphia. That's a very familiar name for me on Twitter. I've seen Lynn a lot on Twitter. Um, we've got Kim from Fairfax County Yay, in Virginia. Virginia. Yeah, and thank you for joining us. This is good. Jeff Miller, Crawfordsville, Indiana, DTT supporter. Guys, you know who this is? Um, Jeff Miller. Je Jeff Miller's my dad. Oh, my dad's watching this. He, yeah. And he, he helps me with ditch that textbook too. He, uh, he does a, a variety of things for me. So hi dad. Hi, dad. Yeah. <laughs> Teresa Silva's here from Chicago. Yeah, Chicago. There's Stephanie DeMichael from Cleveland. There's a bunch of you guys here today. Let me click through just a couple mm -hmm. more real quick. And so we're thankful to have all of you here. There's so many of you. I want to just get right oh into the gosh. content. There's Susie, a fellow Hoosier, although she's actually a boiler maker, which means that she prefers Purdue over IU, and I don't hold that against her. I might <laughs> we, got a, we got someone from London here, so thank Whoa. you for joining us. Yep, there's a whole Ooh. bunch of us here. So now that we've done our introductions, let's start to dive into our content. And today, Holly, we are talking about demonstrating of learning, right? Which is not a scary thing. It's actually something that we do all the time, right? Yeah. And, and we should, and we have to do in remote learning. There's just no way around it now. And now, especially since we don't have those tests on our backs, <laughs> we can really, really try some new stuff. So that's why we are diving in deeper with this. We did a little show on assessment, but we wanted to really get in and show you some examples. We had a few people who said they'd like to see high school examples. So we try to do that. And I just want to say, because, oh, there's someone from Costa Rica, but mm -hmm. um, because we have an Oklahoma person here, there's going to be examples from Oklahoma and we have someone from Oregon, examples from Oregon. So we've curated some really great ones today. Yeah. Um, just want to put up the slides? Yes, absolutely. So we'll jump right over to our slides. And so this is some of the stuff that we've been talking about leading up to today, right, Holly? Mm -hmm. And so last week, and you can go back on Matt's YouTube channel and watch this or on onlinelearningideas.com, but we talked about assessment and the phases of assessment. And what we're going to dive into is this third one today, the demonstrations of learning. And then, um, well, you can keep going and we'll talk about what, what we're going to do on Thursday, which is this. Mm -hmm. We are so excited. Yeah. We're going to do a series. You can talk about it, Matt. So I'm not talking the whole time. Oh, no, that's <laughs> fine. Yeah. So we're going to do a, a video on how to ditch those worksheets. And I know that 
with remote learning, there's, you know, we've heard lots of stories about the worksheet packets and there's lots and lots of worksheet packets. And we just believe that there are different ways that we can engage students and help them to practice and help them to also demonstrate what they learn aside from just giving them photocopied worksheets. We're going to give you lots and lots of examples uh, when it comes to that. We've got one more person that just joined us that I have to introduce you all to. We've got uh, another Miller. That's oh my, my wife, Melanie. She's watching the video oh too. Goodness. Yeah, Hi, there she is. So, <laughs> yeah, and then there's there's Carly from Yay. San Francisco. She's here also. So, okay, this is wonderful. We're getting to have this discussion about demonstrations of learning with all of these friends here. And um, so, uh, let's let's just keep moving. What do you say, Holly? Yeah, and I want to say because we have some really really strong pedagogues in the audience. So, if you have ideas or you have something to say, please talk and, and let us know because we would love to hear from you. So we're going to talk about infusing the learning process with more powerful assessments. And that's what this is about. And we're going to look at how demonstrations of learning can give us really rich information about student learning and growth. And that's something I believe you can't get from a multiple choice question. So we're going to we're going to look at that. So if we can go to the next slide. Yeah. And um, so we're going to talk about what demonstration of learning is we use the words uh, show what you know here at the beginning and this is probably something that you're already doing anyway what we thought that we'd kind of put our finger on it a little bit and um, just kind of touch on what it's what what is involved with it when it, it comes to demonstration of learning because it's it's really product based you know it's it's a question of what can students create now that they have learned to show us what they have learned. And so this is, you know, obviously going beyond the traditional worksheet, the traditional packet, because they're actually creating something with what they've learned. Um, it also involves students showing what they know. Like we said earlier, this is almost like if we were able to peer inside of their brains and yeah. see what is it exactly that they learned? How does it look inside of there? Um, what's the way that they're, they're processing that these demonstrations of learning really give us an opportunity to do that. And it's also based on a learning target. You know, it's important to have goals. Um, that's the way that we understand where we're going and what we want students to do. And so, um, when they have the learning target, that also helps us to see how have they learned and are they reaching that target? So those are, those are some of the parts of that. And it's really creation as learning too. Mm -hmm. So we need to remember that as they're doing this, that's part of the learning process as well. It's not like an end product that they're doing. The whole part is learning. So if you want to go to the next slide, mm -hmm. we're going to look at what we're, we're trying to find out with the goal of assessment. And um, what we want to ask ourselves is, what is this ultimate goal? What are the different ways that we can measure student growth? And they don't have to be around multiple choice questions. Is your assessment giving you the whole story? or just a story in that time and place that might not be replicated, quite frankly, and what part of the story is being left out. And when you have kids who are re learning remotely, a lot of the story might be left out unless you're having them do these kinds of creations. So if we can go to the next one, which I think asks us about data. Mm -hmm. So I have a lot of teachers I work with in Oklahoma, and often they say to me, um, uh, but I got to put a grade in the book. And what do I do? Like, uh, there's got to be numbers. And I'm really trying to help people rethink what numbers don't have to be um, like a bunch of grades that uh, are like, you got a 90 out of 100 or something like this. Like, it doesn't have to be these number points in your grade book, it can really be a more complete picture. And that more complete picture is taking something like an assessment of prior knowledge at the beginning, seeing artifacts along the way till we get a final product. And that's the complete picture we're looking at. And that's the data I want. It's the whole picture. Numbers don't really give me a whole picture. And, mm -hmm. and it's really hard for us to rethink that. Yeah. 
And, you know, I think when it comes to data, too, there are so many different kinds of data that we can gather as well. And it doesn't just have to be how many questions that they get right on this quiz or how many did they get right on this worksheet. Um, you know, data can look a lot of different ways. Um, whenever we have conversations with our students, there are lots of data points that we're processing through our brains that we just don't write down a lot of times. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the the aha moments that you see on students' faces or the confused looks on students' faces, that's data too. Yeah. So just because it doesn't show up in the grade book doesn't mean that it's data. And I love this quote that you've got on the bottom of the slide from Sarah Landis, one of the creators of HyperDocs. And she says, but what do I learn about my students? And there are lots of places and lots of ways that we can learn about students. And the question is, how can those students show us what they know and how can we see what they know and, and kind of put a data point on it? Mm -hmm. And yesterday here in San Diego, where I live, Matt, and you might want to just click a couple more times to get that full screen, which you're going to talk, but they gave out, parents drove up and they gave everyone Chromebooks. And um, what there was, they're doing the training now, I suppose. <laughs> and so a lot of teachers are going to want to jump into the data being something they get from a Google form, and that will be okay at first. And they might ask multiple choice questions at first, but then as we begin to get, begin to get more savvy, we're going to want to look at these kinds of ways. Go ahead, Matt. Oh, wait, I thought you were going to talk about that slide. Oh, that, um, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's right. The, the idea that that's right. I was going to take that slide. Sorry. Um, so I love this quote from Todd Rose um, that he wrote in the end of average. He says 100% of us learn differently. And, you know, he says that the learning variable here, there are so many different variables uh, when it comes to our our students. And so trying to across the board to everybody, um, it's just not possible because there's so much stuff that can fluctuate. And so the question is, do our assessments reflect that variability? Um, and that's tough because in the traditional way that we've done assessment for so long, um, you know, there hasn't been a whole lot of flexibility, but there are some ways that we can build that in. Yep. And let's keep going because we want to be quick on these. Yeah. Um, so if you'll uh, go through to all of it. So we're just going to, we'll give you these slides. You can have these resources. But what we want to take away from this is we want to, we have traditional ways of assessing. And those have always been our multiple choice, our written expression, our closed questions, whatever. And now we're going to go to something that's called a multidimensional approach. And a multidimensional approach means you can solve it different ways. There are different factors that you can bring in. And some of that multidimensional can look more like this for demonstrations of learning, visual representation, something that students are creating that shows like if you're learning about polyga or I, I, do, I wouldn't, I don't do this, you know, in my um, specialty, but like building a bridge instead of just talking about the um, engineering that goes into it, actually applying it. And then open into questions, adding music and tone. That is so important. Can you give me a soundtrack to this novel? That is learning. Um, voice over thinking. This is my favorite. I think it's really one of the most important and the one that people leave out. I see a lot of times on things like Seesaw, people do these great activities and they forget to press record and have the kid explain their thinking. I said this in a TED talk in 2016. I said in 2016, if you're not getting inside of kids' heads, you're not doing it right. And now it's 2020, and we've really got to get inside of the kids' head and let them talk and tell us what they know. So they can do these different mod uh, modes of learning that become this multidimensional. So we're going to show you examples now. We're not going to mm -hmm. talk through all of them. We're just going to highlight a few and we're going to leave this um, for you to look at the other ones. And they're in the form of GIFs. So how can we do this? So let's go look. And I think we're starting. Are we starting right away with Matt? Yeah. So, so I'm going to share my screen. Actually, I don't even need to share my screen on this one. This is an actual example um, from a book creator where a fourth grade teacher, and this is a fourth grade example, but I want you to think if you're a high school teacher, how high schoolers can do this even better. The kids made, um, they took like ownership over decimals. This is Yanai. And Yanai did a video on how to add decimals. If we could play it, it is so cute. He's like, Adding decimals and he gets really into it. 
And then the teacher also has her version there. And the kids can decide what they want to listen to. And what we found with this is that the kids were watching each other's. And, um, and that made you and I take ownership of decimals. Now, don't think that no one else had ownership of decimals because we also just did it differently. Like instead of adding decimals, how about subtracting decimals? Same thing. So each kid got to take ownership of that and put it into a book creator which now lives for other fourth graders. And every year we add to it and we can take some out and put some more in. But doing that in high school would be really, really easy. Or I've seen these incredible things from John Stevens and he, and he does the book Tabletop Math, Table Talk Math. Um, he has a kids doing these, uh, I think they're Desmos. I'm not a math teacher here, but, um, and they, it might be Desmos or Equatio where the kids, make um, polygons dance based on like moving around the Y and X axis. I don't even know if I'm saying this right, but can you imagine putting those into a book creator for kids to see examples of each other? Like, yeah, no, that's, that's, that's such a cool example. And you know, you were talking about how this could definitely move up to, you know, older student levels. And I've seen, um, I can think of one teacher, for example, that has done a version of this same thing. And um, so the teacher is Garth Holman, who's a social studies teacher in Ohio. And what he's done is, and see, this is why this one piqued my interest. It's because instead of using a traditional textbook, had his students create a textbook. Yeah. And it lived on an old wiki site. You remember the wikis are the ones where everybody <laughs> can go in and add to them. Um, since then, it's been sort of updated. But basically, they would go out and they would find information from credible sources and add it to their textbook, which was, you know, based off of this site. Um, and then they continued to kind of level up, level up. Now, in this case, it wasn't a student and a teacher example. This was all student created basically. And so they had to justify what went into the book. They even, once they got the hang of it, they even started doing their own first person information gathering and they would do Skype calls and record them with people who were researching the topic or people who had been there. And so then they were starting to become, you know, basically like first person, well, maybe not first person historians, but like actual historians and gathering that information. And yeah. so um, to say that something like this only works because the example you're seeing on the screen to say that it only works in elementary, um, there's, there's a lot of possibility when it comes to, to other um, grade levels. And I say this a lot. I think Book Creator is the most underused tool there is because people are not thinking of it as this learning journal or as as we see here, um, having students create and, and replace direct instruction. So if we go to the next one, I think we're going to the littles. Is that the next one we're going to? Yeah, I think so. Now, while I'm flipping, while I'm flipping the slides, I wanted to put this up here. Since we've been talking about demonstration of learning, we wanted to ask all of you because you know we've got a bunch of you here watching this video. Yeah. What else would you add about demonstration of learning? The show what you know. What's important? And then, and as you see some of our examples, if you want to tell us about some of your examples, we'd love to share those as well. So either describe them or maybe just drop uh, maybe drop a link in if you've got something like this. Um, I just saw this question pop up real quick. She says, how many letters are there? And I'm like, well, dad's here. And then I realized that my daughter, Cassie, is logged in too. So I've got like, Hi, Cassie. Yeah, we're like stuffing the, the live stream with a whole bunch of Millers. So, oh, goodness. Oh um, you will see on our slides real quick that we do have more math examples. Um, we're going to share a link. You can definitely go to onlinelearningideas.com and go to the big ideas set to the slides there. We'll, we'll drop it into the chat too. But yeah, Littles is the next one. Take it away, Holly. Okay, so I'm going to head over to, I'm hoping it's a little hard to see these. Um, might just be down here. Okay, so this is an example of a little, and I'm talking a seven-year-old doing an Adobe Spark project. And I'm just going to take a second with this one. But what you need to know about the seven-year-old is, and it, um, and this comes from my friend Tanya, is that the seven-year-old is um, dyslexic, dysgraphic, um, has dysgraphia, um, 
he has real troubles like articulating, had troubles reading at first. He's doing a lot better now. But his teacher did something called a thinking map and they brought out information about R Roberto Clemente in this example. And he put it in order and then he put it into an Adobe Spark video. And we're just gonna this watch it for a second. project on Roberto Clemente. Roberto was born on August 16, 1934. He was born in Puerto Rico. Everybody loves Roberto Clemente. He's the best player in the world! <laughs> I have to always show that last part. But you can see, uh oh. But, um, and I'm going to come back. But you can see that this is a project that in Adobe Spark, um, uh, and I'll stop sharing right now. Um, so we can go to style. Sorry, I'm having a little problem. Okay, we're good. Um, that this uh, this kid was able to put this together, and it looks good because Adobe Spark Video gives you templates that make it easy. So he's doing a couple things. He's putting information in order. He's reading it. He's doing a demonstration of learning of this entire unit of Roberto to Clemente. And um, I know this child well. And if he can make something look this easy, we can really get at what he knows because. Uh, he's being able to put these things in order and do them in a way that looks um, that he's very, very proud and doesn't think of himself as a kid with these two learning disabilities, thinks of himself as a kid who can do this. Mm -hmm. I want to show you just one other example really quickly that it doesn't it's like not the best example, but I want you to think uh, in terms of getting at kids thinking. So I'm going to go over to share my screen really quickly and I'm going to go to a seesaw example. And the other day I was in a second grade classroom. And I was walking and I saw these images and these kids had created these great images and I'm trying to see if I can get to it. Okay, here we go. And I said, what are these images about? And the teacher's like, oh, I don't know. I, I didn't ask. And I'm like, why didn't you ask? Because this, we can find out. So I said, let's have the kids take a picture in Seesaw and then record themselves telling what they're doing. Now I want you to look at this and, t and think to yourself, do you know what's happening here? It's kind of hard <laughs> to be able to tell um, from a six-year-old, just barely a six-year-old, by the way. Um, and so if I play it. This is me doing my superpower, helping other people when they need help. Bye. So she's doing her superpower, helping other people when she needs help, when they need help. But who would have known? And we're missing that ability to hear from kids. And it's why I want to have a, a T-shirt that says press record. Mm -hmm. Because I, people just need to start, don't just have kids do that. Then put it on Seesaw. Then take it into Flipgrid and say, what does this mean? So we can get it thinking. Um, what's our next yeah. one? Yeah, no, that's, that's totally right. Can I, I wanted to riff on that for just a second because yeah. so often to us and we have to try to make sense of what's on the page um, or what's on the screen. But if we give them the opportunity, and this is what Seesaw does so well, if we give them the opportunity to record their voice explaining it, it does a couple of okay. things. One, it gives us more information to go on. It gives us more to be able to see inside their brains like we were talking about. But two, what it also does is it gives them the opportunity to practice those presentational skills too. You know, the ability to speak and get their ideas across and try to speak in extemporaneously. And so that's, that's definitely a really good one. Um, before we move on to this next one, I wanted to throw a couple of comments up on the screen. Natasha says, I've loved using Flipgrid to have my students do a brain dump on what we're doing. And that's such a quick way. Yeah. To see what's in kids brains. And there's also research, um, in retrieval practice that talks about how doing these brain dumps helps stick that information into their long-term memory better. So it's not just a demonstration of learning. This is a way to practice and to get that stuff into their long-term memory. So that's really good. And then Carly's a big fan of Seesaw also. So easy <laughs> to use for any child at any age. So Good and stuff. I want to say that, Carly, that you said any child at any age, for sure, even seniors. We're not getting into seniors' heads. We're just having them write, 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 and we're not asking them to talk a lot of times. Mm -hmm. Yep. I love this comment too from Monica, who is a sketch note guru in yeah. her own mind. Yeah. <laughs> not in her own mind, in her own right is what I meant to say. I said in your own mind. That sounded really bad. That's not what I was going <laughs> for, I promise. He says, students could talk you through a sketch note. So if you're doing these visual notes and put those on the screen, they could talk about what all the different parts are. So good yep. stuff. 
I All right, let's keep higher middle school do that. Um, okay, so the next one, um, instead of going to um, the slides, Matt, that you have up, can you just tell me what the next one is and I'll go show the example? Is yeah. It like yeah, the next one is, yeah, it looks like a picture of President Obama. Oh, yeah, but those are the just the examples we're oh, gotcha. not doing. Um, and here's more for the littles, brain dumps. But um, if we keep going to the one that has the colored background, this there is a is. poetry anthology. But I want to show you this one. And this is um, what I want to call 21st century writing. And so I'm going to head over and tell me if you can see this now on the screen. Can you see this? Or do I need to share? We're still on Ella. So, yeah, you'll need to share on that one. Okay. And let me just stop and come back and start again and go to Chrome. Okay, so we should be seeing it in one second. Mm -hmm. And um, so what you're going to be seeing is the one that's kind of going through in the background. And I don't know why it's not coming up, but here we go. It should work now. And this is what I would like to call, like, you know, you think of your five paragraph essay. And here is an Adobe Spark page, which is a web page. And when people think of it, I think they think, oh, I'm not doing web pages. But in your writing class, if you did this with a five paragraph essay. So here's your first paragraph the kids written about. They're writing about their grandfather who helped save um, Jews during the Holocaust. And then here's his childhood and he lived in Denmark. Well, let me think, let me do put on my critical thinking skills and decide what image would go good with this. Oh, how about an image of Denmark? So now we're bringing a multidimensional approach to writing and bringing it into the 21st century. So I'm going to show some pictures of his childhood because that's what that paragraph was it about. And now we're going to go to the second paragraph. Okay, during the Holocaust. What are we going to uh, show during that time? Of course, pictures from the Holocaust. So we get a, um, an understanding. We're going to talk in our third paragraph about family. And so we're going to show family. And what I love about this, and I'm going to scroll down even more, we get through it, our, our next paragraph. But at the end, because of um, Adobe Spark's ability, we end with her interviewing her grandfather. And oh. Tanya, yeah, I mean, that's mic drop to me. And Tanya told me yesterday that the Savannah um, is a student of hers and she couldn't get her to stop working on this. She was just like, hey, can I go work on my project? And she's like, well, we're working on something else now. She's like, but I need to put some finishing touches. And, you know, that's the time when we really have um, really hit it home as teachers when kids don't want to put their work down. Mm -hmm. So that was an example of the 21st century learning yeah, I think that's that's such a great example. And it's just like what you said. Um, this is what really, it's like the multidimensional part of this is where having the technology options really makes the work sing. You know, because if we were just trying to jot this down on a piece of paper or even just type it into a document, that is one dimensional. We've got text yeah. and that's it. But when we're able to pull in images, when we're able to pull in video, when we're able to pull in audio, when we're able to mash all of those up, now all of a sudden the students get to make new and different choices to show what they know and to be able to make those connections. And that's the stuff that's missing if we don't if we don't have that available to us. So yeah, if we've got that available during remote learning right now, that is excellent stuff. And these are all tools um, that can be used on the phone as well. I want to point that out. I, don't, I haven't shown anything that couldn't be used on a phone. So if for even for the kids who don't have access, I know there's data issues. I, I know. I know lots, but um, still. Okay, so uh, what is our next example? We've got Book Bento. Uh, this you is love my the... favorite. <laughs> uh -huh. so I'm going to so cool. um, share my screen and... Mm -hmm. I'm going to head over. Sorry, I, sh I wish it was a little bit faster for me to do. But I got this idea from one of my really good friends, my close friend, Lisa Heifel, who I probably talk to as often as possible. And she was doing book bentos. And um, we were doing short stories. So I was like, but wait, couldn't I just make that a short story bento? And so um, I turned this into a story bento. And a bento box is a Japanese box where you, you kind of categorize your food so that they don't touch each other sort of thing because they're all... Uh, different parts. I don't know the the background of the bento box, but I, I asked students to go in after reading a story 
um, and I told him about it, but I, I showed him examples of other bento boxes people had done around books. And you can see here, people are taking books and they're finding objects that represent that. And that's a little bit of like a diorama to me that wasn't super impressive. What is impressive is when we take this into Seesaw or Flipgrid, or my kids took it into Adobe Spark Video, and they took those uh, five things and they explained why this was an important part of the story. So we were reading um, An Appointment with Love. I don't know if you've read it. It's about a, um, a appointment at a train station where this soldier is meeting someone and um, it's really good short story. Anyway, the kids had to bring in these elements. They did it on a slide like this. And then they brought each of those elements into an Adobe Spark video and explained their thinking. So um, that is a really fun way. And I'm going to show one other one while I'm over here of um, a kid who is doing using Adobe Spark video. And I'm all Adobe Spark today, it feels like. <laughs> but um, but this because you can use this on a phone and because it's easy to do and I don't have to teach kids how to make movies. This kid is doing um, a book report around Harry Potter and having to choose and you're going to love this, Matt, choose um, icons from the noun project. Ooh, so yes. They're thinking. So let me like show you this. Hey, rally. Harry can't wait to get back to Hogwarts. But when a strange creature does it, Ooh, we can't see it, Holly. Oh, you can't? No, you're still on the book bento slides. Oh, no, no, no. I'm sorry. Thank you for telling me. Yep, that's so okay. I will come back. And when you do that Chrome tab, you got to keep it in that Chrome tab. Yeah. We're <laughs> um, still getting the hang of all this a little yeah. bit. Yeah. And next time it'll probably be a little bit better. But I'll really quickly do this. And then, um, so this student, can you see it now? Got it now. Okay, so Harry can't wait to go back to Hogwarts, but when a strange creature doesn't want Harry to leave because something bad will happen at Hogwarts. So we get the point, and I'm going to come back. But um, but you have to critically think about which of those icons shows, and you and I do it all the time, Matt. We've got to think about the icon that shows the the information we're putting out there. So there's a lot of critical thinking and being able to do that, and yet simplicity where a student can't fail. So it's these creative constraints that I just think make for an amazing project. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. We had a, a question in here about the bentos. So, mm. so bento box is creating a poster. I mean, it kind of can be, but not not necessarily. Not right? for me. So it can just be like creating it on a slide and whatever. But but to me, that falls short. When you don't press record on that, you um you lose the ability to explain it. But yeah, it's taking five objects and we'll share this. I'll put the link mm -hmm. in this slide deck and you can see the bento box example from, from books. I gave you a short story one, but, um, but yeah, it's just picking those elements that represent that part of the story. And like I said, it's a little diorama esque until you press record. Yeah. And the, the couple of examples that we've got on the screen here, if you look, for instance, see, these were done with images just to get started. And so you can see on the one on the left, it looks like they've got some wheat along the left. And then they've got the book in the middle because we're talking about the book. They put the book in there. And then you notice up above it, they used a shoe to create a footprint. And then you've got rope to the right. And you can imagine that each one of these things has significance. And so whenever students get a chance to record, or um, I've even seen um, students use a tool like ThingLink. You know, ThingLink lets mm -hmm. them put little clickable yeah. dots on top of each of those mm -hmm. things. And whenever you click on one of those dots, it opens up text and it explains why they put that in there. But it's basically just giving them the opportunity to creatively make choices about the books, put them into an image, and then describe why those things made it in the image instead of other things. And it's such a cool activity. I really, really love it. And it can cross over to so many things other than books. These are book bentos, but I mean, I could see this there being, you know, history bentos, or you could see science bentos, or, I mean, there's so Spanish much you could do. Bento, that, right? Yeah. And absolutely. what if you did a Spanish absolutely. language bento and you did it in Spanish, like voila, oh, that's French, but you know what I'm saying? Voila, say oh, right. <laughs> whatever. Yeah, yeah. Math bentos. There you go. There's another good example. Mm -hmm. there. So, yeah. All right. Um, 
Okay, so what's our next one? I'm afraid to go to the Chrome thing again, but um, yeah. so we just put in some other examples. I wanted to show you a science example that comes out of Oregon where, you know, I feel bad showing another Adobe Spark, but this is a high school example. So I really wanted to get it at a high school example. So let me head over and I'll, it'll only take me a second this time. But these kids are using Adobe Spark video to explain the scientific process. And I liked it because it were, was high school. And it comes from John Samuelson out of Beaverton, who I'm the Friend Hello, of and fan of. Here's an introduction to the scientific method. First, you make an observation. An observation can be done by looking around the world. Here are some examples of where you can look to make your observation. You can look around the countryside, in a city, or you can even. So pretty good. I'm going to come back, but um. But just a way of kind of putting your knowledge together to show that you've learned something. So we got to talk about the scientific method. Oops, sorry, I'm coming back. Um, it's a really great way to like show your learning. And and Matt, I know that you're thinking this too, but this is so simple in the remote learning environment. Create oh, yeah. something. Mm -hmm. Create and show me your learning. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, and really, if we if we think about some of the traditional ways that we've shown had students show what they know. The, the question I always have is, are they really showing what they know? Or are they really just checking boxes off? You know, are mm -hmm. they really just, you know, complying? And whenever you've got to create something, I know one of the big questions that people have right now with remote learning is, how do we do testing on it? How do we do quizzes on it so that the kids don't copy and they don't cheat and everything? And, you know, one sort of silver bullet to all of that is to have students create something. Because yeah. if you look at all of the examples that Holly's been sharing, None of those things are the things that you can Google and find the correct answer to the multiple choice question on. These are the things that come out of the kid's heart and come out of their yeah. mind and they put it onto the screen and they show us what they know. And those are the kinds of things that, that make yeah. me really happy. Yeah. I love that you said heart. Mm -hmm. Yeah. True. Absolutely. So we've gotten some really good comments here too. Uh, Melanie was talking about ThingLink or Google drawings, you should have kids link a video explanation to each image. Yeah. So like um, if we were talking about the bento, mm -hmm. whether book bentos or math bentos or history bentos or whatever, each little image that's on there, you have a link, a clickable link, and then they're able to go off. Or screencastify for the win. Mm -hmm. screencastify, yeah. Just screencast your, your slide and tell us what you're thinking. Mm -hmm. Here's another one. I haven't read this one yet. Another multidimensional SW show what you know tool is ArcGIS story maps. I've heard of mm -hmm. this mm -hmm. and products like Holly Spark presentation with the mm -hmm. map in Denmark, but with dynamic maps too. Good for districts that don't allow Adobe Spark because we did have a question. There up are here. Some. Mm -hmm. Yeah, from from Michelle. She said in New York with new privacy protocols, we got to make sure that we can use them. Um, and it, but if you can, that's great. And then if you can't, you know, you've got other options as well. Well, kind of like the Arc GIS story maps that, that I think it's Kim was was telling us about. So, yeah, and there are some some schools don't allow seesaw, which I'm like shocked over. But you live within your limitations, so you put it on a slide and you do a screencastify or you you know whatever it is, um, yeah. and hopefully you get spark soon. Right, uh, right. <laughs> um, so, so we have just a couple more examples, right? Just with art, but. Yeah. Um, and uh, I'll, I'll quickly just show this. I love this. Uh, again, I don't. I didn't mean to. I should have pre-thought about this, but I apparently I'm doing all Spark for some reason, and I don't mean. <laughs> That's okay. Don't mean That's okay. There. Spark is good. And see, what's good about that too is that we get to see multiple uses of the same tool. So now it's not like use this tool to do this, and use this tool to do this, and use this tool to do this. It's like. These are all yeah. things you can do with one. So it's not bad how it turned out. I don't and you can anyway. do this with Google Slides and just put on Screencastify sure. and add some music. Do, you know, like you can do all of this. So mm -hmm. here's an art. I love this. This kid is just going to explain what art is and then show some pictures. Right, We're not going to see it all. Colors on a paper. So much more than lines from a pencil. This is so good. More than paint. How did that student animate that? I don't know that answer. A gateway to new ideas and images one can only begin to dream about. There's endless possibilities and no wrong answers. It's a doorway to the imagination. Anything and everything. So 
Matt, we know she could use something like Brush Ninja, which Matt and I um, are liking right now. So if you wanna um, just go look up Brush Ninja, it allows you to animate. But I'm assuming here she used Adobe Post. And then um, while she was drawing, but these kids I do know have iPads. So probably had a little something to do with that too. She could have been in Paper 53 and then brought it into Adobe Spark Video. Mm -hmm. Um, so, and one last thing, and someone brought this up earlier, um, someone who's a great sketch noter. Um, I had students do a full on, I taught every student in the middle school, it was called a day of sketch noting, how to sketch note. We used a Sylvia Duckworth 20 minute video and they all came in and learned icons. And then they went back and we had a, um, we had a challenge for them. And we wanted to do something fun. So this is a selfie that they draw, um, telling about themselves, but you can see there's a play button there and we had them tell us why they chose what they chose and tell us about their image. And now um, because we brought them all into the library and had them learn how to do these icons, we can now expect that teachers are using this kind of drawing um, learning it's not even, it's really just a learning, a way of learning in history class, in English class, in social studies. And that's what we've seen. I even have a um, day of sketch noting Google Classroom that you can join and maybe I can put the link in here with all of the resources that we used. And I know you're not gonna be in a class, but you could just send out that Sylvia Duckworth video to your kids and they could learn how to do some of the icons. And she talks about it. And she talks about different examples from classrooms. So something to even allow kids to show their learning that way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Ah, this has been such good stuff. I think we're getting down to the end here. So I think we've got question and answer. So I just dropped this into the, the chat earlier. If you've got questions, drop them in here. But we've had, I mean, we've had a handful of them kind of all the way through. Um, but we'll keep an eye out here real quick to see. I'm also going to see if there's anything else. Monica mentioned that oh, Apple yes. Clips is awesome for explaining too. Yes. I'm obsessed with clips, but if you don't, if you're Chromebooks and stuff, you can't use it, but kids can use it on their phone and turn it into classroom or teams. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh. Yeah. Here's a question. If you had to pick one video recording platform to show students, what would you choose? Screencastify or Flipgrid? <laughs> it's like choosing between your children, right? Oh my gosh. It's like Sophie's choice. Uh, they're yeah. different for different things. I got to tell yeah. you, I, I, agree. I need both. I can't make the decision. Yeah, I think that Screencastify, first of all, Screencastify runs in the Chrome web browser as an extension. So if your students are using Chrome, if they're on Chromebooks, it's a good fit. And you can record with your, your um, sorry, you can record with your webcam, you can record your screen or a combination of both. And the nice thing about it is it, sa it saves everything directly to Google Drive, which makes it really easy for students to turn things into Google Classroom. Now, Flipgrid is really good also with mobile devices. You can definitely run it on a Chromebook or on a laptop yeah. as well, but you can also run it very well on mobile devices, which you can't do with um, Screencastify. And of course, Flipgrid does have lots of fun features like um, stickers and the ability to put images onto the screen um, and filters. Or and now turn they've got that off. <laughs> I do that to yeah, yeah, that's right. Um, you can also do screen recordings now on Flipgrid if you're using it on a um, laptop or Chromebook. So all of those are great options, I think. And I think a number one question I get when I'm out doing PD is when would you use Flipgrid and when would you use Seesaw? And for me, they're just different. For Flipgrid, I'm doing something that I can watch Netflix style as I watch student responses. And I can't really do that in Seesaw. So Seesaw, I'm trying to get them to really um, do something that they can um, that they can share more easily with the class and put into a folder that shows their learning over time, which I can't really do as easily on Flipgrid. So it depends on the task for me. Yeah, 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 yeah absolutely. absolutely. Holly, can Holly, you turn your volume down a little bit? We've got We've another got up here from, from, again, I again, think his name was Kim earlier. You can, you can animate, animate by doing a series of Google slides. slides. Holly, can you Holly, turn your volume, volume down? down? I did it. We need to get you some earphones. Oh, I'm sorry about that. <laughs> yep, that's okay. You can animate by doing a series of Google slides, each slide adding a little more to the previous slide. Oh my goodness, this is one of my favorite ways to use Google Slides or PowerPoint 
is to do an animation like this. Then recording it as you play light stop motion. That's a really, really good one. Okay, we've got, um, oh, Alicia said, in regards to Screencast 5 versus Flipgrid, I think it's also worth considering audience. Is it just to turn into a teacher or is it for classmates to view, comment, respond? Because totally. that's a yeah. really good point because Flipgrid really does have great ways to do that communication. Um, you could do a little bit of it in Screencastify, but I think Flipgrid is definitely more built for that. We got one and more quick question. Sorry? Yeah. There's one about whiteboards too. Yep. That was it. And then I think we're going to be about done. Recommendations for whiteboard platforms. What do you say, Holly? I'm um, really loving Jamboard and the ability to collaborate. Mm -hmm. And yeah. there's also Jamboard talking, uh, whiteboard. Yeah. And then of course you could also go with Flipgrid again too, because you can turn the camera off and turn on a white or black background and then work on top of that. So I think that could and record your thinking, which I don't know if you can do in Jamboard. I'm not hundred percent sure. Yeah. 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 All right. Very good. This has been great. Any last uh, last second thoughts, Holly, as we wrap up? No, I'm I'm loving having all these people here, especially all the Millers, because I've never met them and they probably know I'm talking to you every once in a while. So. Right. Ah. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. No. And I've, I've been thrilled about this video. I think this is this has been a lot of fun to get to kick around ideas for demonstrations of learning. And the thing that I hope that we kept coming back to is the fact that it doesn't have to be the way that it was done to you when you were a kid and that there are lots of ways where kids can create and use that creation to show what they know. And it ends up being better for everybody. You know, the kids enjoy doing it more. You enjoy grading it more and seeing all the cool things that the kids have created. And it really does give us a better picture of what's in their mind, I think. So I think, you know, whatever direction you take this with, I think your students will thank you. And thank you all for coming. Yes, absolutely. And don't forget to teach that worksheet. Right. Yeah, that's coming up. That's coming up on Thursday. If you're watching this on a video recording on the, the replay, then definitely go look up Ditch That Worksheet on the Ditch That Textbook YouTube channel. So thank you all so much for being here. If you haven't subscribed to the channel, please do, because we're going to continue to have more and more of these live videos and really, really enjoyed spending some time with you. Take care, <laughs> be well, and we'll see you on the next video. Bye to your dad. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Bye, Dad. <laughs>